Hi, guys, and welcome to the Dead by Tomorrow podcast. My name is Daniel Winter, and my co-host is Andrew Monroe. In each episode, Andrew and I will explore topics that you should think about before you die. We encourage you to remember that some tomorrow will be your last, so each day could be your final chance to really live. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the episode. Welcome back to the show. We are thrilled to have you again. Today, we're going to be talking about Never Say No to Awesome. This is actually chapter one in the book, and this is the last chapter really on the podcast that we need to cover that goes over everything from the book we've talked about. Obviously, we'll have more episodes for you, but this is kind of the final episode that covers what we've talked about in the Dead by Tomorrow book. So, Daniel, what does Never Say No to Awesome mean to you? Yeah, so the chapter name, Never Say No to Awesome, came from a work situation where somebody basically needed help with something. It was a deal where nobody really wanted to do it because it wasn't anybody's actual responsibility with somebody being asked to take on something extra. And so I was a part of the plea going out to do that. And I kind of looked at my day and was like, you know, I, I've got the time to do this. I definitely could do this. And so my response to this person who needed help was, um, it, and to, the, sorry, let me back up here, hit a reset button on that. So this chapter came from the name of the chapter, so to speak, came from a work situation where somebody needed help and they were asking a whole big group of people saying, hey, who can be awesome and jump in and help me out with this. And it's, it was a, a task that wasn't too difficult. It was just annoying and nobody really had to do it. And so what I did was looked at my day, definitely knew that I could take it on and help out. And so my response to this person was, I never say no to awesome, load me up. And so the idea of the chapter, never say no to awesome, we put it at the front of the book because I think it does a good job of sort of kicking off one of the more important mindsets that we lay out throughout various chapters, which is saying, hey, Think more intentionally about the asks that come across you each and every day and don't be so quick to say no to things. Maybe that's partially influenced by the movie Yes Man being really pivotal <laughs> to, to us uh, growing up, coming out at a, at a formative time of life and having an unhealthy obsession with Jim Carrey. But I really do think there is value in challenging yourself to say yes more often and having a little bit more of a, a loose baseline to what might be a beneficial thing to say yes to. And so within the chapter, we're putting forth that challenge of try to say yes, never say no to awesome. At the same time, don't just go full Jim Carrey, say yes to everything. We kind of lay out a few ground rules and that's really centered around considering your ability considering your capacity and then just considering the the impact of whatever thing is put in front of you i did love yes man that was such a fun movie <laughs> you know i still think on a regular basis about that movie there I, whatever situation comes up there'll be moments where i'm like wanting to say no to something and i'm like ah. Remember that movie? Yes, man. You got to say yes. And admittedly, it's a terrible metric to just do things, but it does hit me more often than it should for a grown adult male in his 30s. <laughs> but but all right. He's our guru. He's, he knows everything. So one of the things that we talked about in this is time as a resource. And you we're, we're going to start from kind of the, I would say, the less yes side of it. We're saying say yes to things, never say no to awesome, which is such a great coin of phrase. But coin of phrase. Oh, I'm so bad at idioms, Daniel. I'm so <laughs> sorry, everyone. <laughs> Turn of phrase. I'm going to start it with the time as a resource part. We talked about how we set some parameters out there and these rules. And and for those people listening, this was this was probably Daniel's first chapter that he wrote, if I remember right. And it was it was one of the defining chapters of how we did this, but it mostly was done by Daniel. So a lot of these questions are going to be balled towards him, thrown towards him. There we go again with the idioms. We're on a roll today. Ah, I you know I need to watch Boondock Saints again, I guess, and think of the barkeeper. <laughs> so, what do you mean whenever like how do you, how would you define it? Do you have any examples, especially post publishing of the book? Do you have any examples of when you've had to say no 
to an opportunity, when you had to say no to being awesome, to protect either your time or other resources or other projects? Yeah, there have been a few of them, and that's in part because of being a new dad over the course of the the past 14 months. And so uh, an example is that my sister, Beth, who we've had on the podcast, works with an organization called Forerunner Mentoring, which is an amazing organization. Their entire aim is to pair men who are living out a, a life that is um, wholesome of integrity, you know, is really following Christian values and pairing them with young boys that don't have a father figure in their lives, whether it's, uh, you know, dad just kind of up and left, whether it's dad's in prison, you know, dad passed away, whatever it is, doing that pairing to provide them an opportunity to have just a, a strong, positive male influence in their life. And it's an amazing program. And so pre COVID pre Riley, I was set to start doing some mentoring and then basically right after my pairing conversation with DJ and his mom, COVID sort of hit, everything went on pause. They sort of backed out of the program just for, for their own safety. And within that time frame, I also became a dad. And so it, it hit a point where I, I think it was January, maybe January of this year that, uh, the, the director of mentoring reached back out and said, you know, Hey, DJ's coming back into the program, wanted to see if you'd be able to kind of jump back in and, and sort of pick up. And at that time, Riley was still kind of learning how to sleep. I had just fairly recently come back off of new parent leave. And so was getting back into the swing of works work had been assigned a new team i actually joined a board for university of houston for this consumer experience sort of certificate program thing and so at that point in time i had to say hey like based on all of the other things that are going on right now i need to say no in this moment and it it was truly a, a thing of capacity and, and being able to say, all right, I, I've said yes to all of these other things. I need to honor those commitments and really put my best foot forward and not try to take on something else that I know would be a great opportunity. I know it'd be really life-giving, just not the right season for it. And so fast forward to you know, where we're at now, almost a year later, there have been a few things that have shifted around. One, Riley's you know, pretty good at sleeping now. The U of H thing has pretty much, um, you know, completed work is in a much more stable place. So I'm back into a point where now I am doing mentoring again and was able to eventually say, yes, it just needed to, some time needed to pass some, some, uh, capacity needed to free up. That's well done. It's hard to say no to stuff like that, but it's important to make sure you can follow through with the commitments you have prior to, you know, awesome opportunities. And leading the witness here, that is something that is kind of a theme throughout the book is commitment. I think we actually had, it shows up a lot. We'll just leave it at that. Commitment's a really big thing in this book. And part of the Never Say No to Awesome and uh, the chapter that is, was making sure you could commit to something you were saying yes to or not saying no to. So if you know you're in for double negatives here. So when we talked about commitment, it was, that was one of the big things that we talked about was, can you commit to this? You know, would Daniel be able to commit to mentoring, you know, somebody, which that's a very, that's something you should really take seriously. Cause if you're going to, you're going to say yes to something like that, you can't just half ass it. That's just borderline immoral, but that applies to everything. If you are saying yes to a project at work, if you're saying yes to a D and D campaign, you know, all these different things, you need to be able to commit to it. So how do you stick with commitments, Daniel? How do you know, like, hey, this commitment is going to take this much effort from me. It's going to provide this much value. Where does commitment fall in your life? And how, how do you measure that against being able to choose what you're going to say yes to? As far as how I am able to honor commitments, a lot of that has just been years of really seeking to build up that reputation, years of mentors and and just influences really reinforcing 
your word is valuable and you should honor your word and, and seeing when that's done well, seeing how much respect I have for people that honor commitments and then being burned plenty of times when people said that they would do something and they didn't and it hurts. It, it really does not feel good to be on the receiving end of that. And so just recognizing I want to do my very best to not be that type of person. And so with commitment, it's recognizing that little things do matter. The small commitments do matter. If you say that you're going to show up to somebody's concert or you know, somebody's whatever it is, and it's, you know, there's not any money on the line and it's not going to change anybody's life if you're not able to make it, you know, follow through with those little things. Be somebody who, when you say you're going to do something, you do it and having people to hold you accountable and, and people to sort of call you out if you're getting on a trend of, of not following through with some of those things. And so that's, that's one way to honor commitments. And then the other way is to, again, to not over commit learning when it is appropriate to say no and recognizing that you're saying no to one thing so that you can say yes to a more important thing, figure out how to, to balance some of your priorities and, and kind of thinking about things with a little bit of a, an opportunity cost mindset, applying sort of some economics to it of, okay, if I say yes to jumping back into this mentor relationship, what is it going to cost me? Okay. Maybe it costs me playing video games a little bit more than I have or more often something obviously I want to do, but that's an easy cost to say, okay, I can give that up. Or maybe it, it costs me, you know, time just kind of sitting around doing my own thing. Like it, that, that's a cost worth giving up. If it instead is costing me time, my family where, you know, that's kind of the only time of day that I get to be with them and I'm giving that up or it's costing me, um, uh, time that I've already said yes to another thing. I need to say no before I am committed. So it's, it's just kind of taking that mindset of don't overextend yourself, make sure that you really give care to the little things and, and keep in mind that you're not going to be able to do everything that is set in front of you. That's okay. But also challenge yourself to be a little bit less selfish with your time where you can and, and be strategic about how you say yes to stuff. So what's kind of cool about what you said there was, you know, sticking through with your word. And that is a huge thing to me. That was one of my little stories I put in there was uh, sticking to my word somewhere in the, you know, book, not necessarily in the commit in the uh, never say no awesome chapter, but commitments is huge thing to me. And it's funny because I just finished reading slash listening to the four agreements. One of our other guests recommended it. And unfortunately it's taken me forever to get around to it, but I uh, listened to it just uh, this past weekend and it was great. One of the rules in it was you must be impeccable with your word. And that's the whole point of it. It's basically, if you do what you're going to say you're going to do and you follow through on your commitments, it gives you this, they call it heaven in the book. I mean, it, provides you heaven in the book. It makes you happy. It brings you satisfaction. It makes you not suffer. Um, it's, it's a positive thing. It's one of the main ways to live a more fulfilling life. So I think commitment's really important and it's really cool that it, it shows up in all these different places. If you ask anybody, you know, that is wise and has lived a good life, that is going to probably be one of the things that they talk about, or at least that they show through action is how they follow through with their commitments and how they are true to their word. And it's something that is getting more and more rare as our society evolves. And it's because it's become easier and more expected to not necessarily follow through anymore. You know, you might have a, a plan to go out with some friends, but you give a tentative yes, or you say yes with the idea like, well, I'm, I'm going to meet up with them unless I get a good cool date coming out of, you know, Tinder, or if some other plans show up with some cooler people and I want to go do this other thing, or, you know, maybe I just decided I don't want to go. So I'm just going to stay home, but maybe I'll change my mind and maybe I'll go. So you just told me this kind of wishy-washy, lack of commitment driven culture that we have now is to me, poison both to our mental health and to the people around us. So I really do think commitment to your word and commitment in general is really important. And that's why being able to 
decide whether or not an opportunity that comes up, something that you can be awesome at, is so important to know where your the rest of your commitments stand because you don't want to commit to one thing and it causes you to break your word on something else. That's a terrible situation to be in, both for you and whoever you committed to. You know, a more extreme example of this might be you get married. You should not be trying to find a new wife. That's that's bad. You don't want to get married to two different women. Think of that next time you are trying to decide, you know, what a commitment is. You don't you don't want to be in that spot. So I hope that's a silly enough metaphor or analogy for people to hook on to next time they're thinking about things and ways to be awesome. So I've done a lot of questions at you, Daniel. Do you have anything on this that you want to go over or have me talk about? No, I'm, I'm still just trying to think through the the whole two wide thing. It's just, it's a scary thought. It's a terrible and... place to be. <laughs> that doesn't end well for anyone. <laughs> No, it's an apt example, though. I mean, you you can't you just can't split your focus um, and expect to be successful. And so I think another another issue that I feel like comes up often sort of in a lot of our culture right now is just the over of choice. And so I'm curious to get some of your thoughts around how does that impact commitment? How does that impact our ability to say yes to the awesome things. The fact that you, you brought up Tinder, dating apps are something you can just have all the dates at your fingertips that you would like. We play video games together now and we have this Xbox Game Pass where there are hundreds of games you can just download and load up and play. So how do you feel like the just overabundance of choice make some of the the concepts from never say no to awesome more challenging so it's funny you ask that uh it's, it's something i've talked a lot about outside of the podcast with numerous people uh, especially derek you know our last podcast guest i what is that coincidentally ironically it's a it's a hot topic for me because i think about it a lot because it has become a serious problem in my mind dating is a really good example of it uh, whenever you have all of this you know perceived choice out there it makes following through with a potential relationship or a potential marriage a lot harder when you're like, you know, there's this little tiny thing. I'm really not about it. So I might as well not do that and deal with this. And instead, I'm going to go start fresh with someone new, someone exciting. And you get in a cycle where all of a sudden you you almost seem picky because you just keep getting the re-roll and try and get that that next person, that new experience. and it's it's short term really gratifying because you're seeing all of these people that think you're attractive in some form or fashion or want to spend time with you and uh, it gives you that dopamine hitch bam 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 you're you're a good looking guy or girl people want to hang out with you and it's it's fun and it's cool but long term it's really bad for the long term and as humans we're terrible at long term thinking uh, speaking from personal experience in just about every aspect of my life my long term uh, planning skills and danger, things that are bad for me. It's just kind of non-existent. We didn't, you know, that's just not how our brains are wired. We aren't, we aren't seeing that McDonald's is going to kill us in 30 years. We see the snake and we worry about the snake on the ground. You know, that rattlesnake, that's something that triggers our flight or fight response. But going to McDonald's, even though we know it's bad for us, well, what is that one happy meal this time or, you know, whatever that is, we don't see long-term consequences nearly as well. We don't see it financially. We don't see it health-wise. There's lots of stuff we do long-term that's bad. And that goes to that opportunity of choice with dating. You don't see what, what's happening long-term, which is a dissatisfaction with your relationship. You're not getting that, that incredible connection that someone who's committed and followed through and spent years culturing a relationship gets. It's that satisfaction of a hard day's work almost. You're not getting that in this current culture because it's constant grass is greener on the other side. And you can, there's no fence anymore. You can just go onto the other grass. You don't have to hop the fence anymore. You just go. Um, I'm mixing many metaphors here, so I hope everybody's keeping up. So it's terrible. There's a book that is called You're Not As Smart As You Think You Are. And I love this book. It's just this book of psychological studies they did and kind of the, uh, the end result in layman's terms. So someone, you know, that is not <laughs> nearly versed enough to understand those studies. It's great for someone like me or probably most of our listeners where it says, hey, this is the study. This is how they did it. 
um, you can trust us that it was done right because I've gone over the research and here was the end result and what that means for you. And it's it's really well, easy laid out. You don't have to have a doctorate to understand it. Well, you probably don't even have to have a degree of any kind. Uh, it's, but one of the studies I did in this was really interesting and it goes with this opportunity choice problem. And it, this applies to dating, this applies to your career, this applies to a lot of different aspects in your life. You can probably just name something and apply it if you think it you know matches. So what they did was they had a bunch of people and they gave them these cameras and they had them go take all these cool pictures and cool places or something like that. And I'm butchering the uh, the details here. The broad brush strokes are going to be accurate though. So what they did, they had the two groups, everybody took pictures. At the end of the picture taking, artistic picture taking specifically session, they had group A go in and they had eight or nine or 10 uh photographs to choose from basically what they're doing was they're going to blow this photograph up into a cool giant portrait to hang on the wall at the house all uh, wealthy family style problem was you only got to take one you you got to pick one of your 10 pictures that they turned into these giant portraits and you only got to take one home group b only got one choice basically they took the pictures they took and said all right here's your best picture and this is the portrait of it thanks for participating so what they were studying was not people's picture taking skills or anything like that. They were seeing what happens with what is basically buyer's remorse or regret towards making the decision. And the end result was the people with the more choices of which portrait they wanted, which picture they wanted to hang, were less satisfied with the one they took home. Whereas the people who only had that one option were much more satisfied. They were much happier with their choice or the lack of choice five years, 10 years down the road. And this is probably why arranged marriages seem to work out a little bit more. People understand that you have to, and, and that's not like Andrew making some random thing up. They have shown that arranged marriages are less likely to end in divorce than I, I think what Eastern culture calls uh, love marriages. But it's not because a love marriage is necessarily bad. It's because as a society, people like us who believe in love marriage, which for the record, I do think is the proper way to do this, but sometimes we forget what love is and we, we think we fall out of love because some of those fresh, exciting things that we you know, thought was love aren't there and we forget that it's work, that there's hard work and, you know, involved with it. And our opportunity of choice, that regret uh, psychological factor comes into play and we go, well, Remember that one person that you really had a good time with before your wife or before your husband? They, they were pretty cool and you get these rosy tinted glasses of the past. You go, wow, I had such a good time with them. Maybe I should have married them. Maybe there's someone else like that still out there. I'm not really enjoying this relationship I'm in, this marriage I'm in. And this, this applies to everything. We're using relationships because it's easy and it was kind of one of the you know, starting topic here and it kind of goes with the portraits. But basically the less choices we have, the happier we are psychologically. And so we're, we're crossing into this divide of we have so many choices that it's kind of messing us up. A video games was a great example you talked about. I just watched 8-Bit Christmas last night. Have you seen that yet? No, not yet. No, you need to watch it. It's Neil Patrick Harris. Uh, it's just a cute, good little Christmas movie. And there's a part in it where he's playing the Super Nintendo at the store. And I remembered as a kid, how crazy I was about playing the Super you know, it, In my case, it was the PlayStation 2, I think, or maybe it's the PlayStation 1. You need to play those video games at Target at the kiosk on the corner while I'm all shopped. I lost my mind for it. And they kind of touch on that in this movie. And that was how video games were. I remember you know, maybe a video game every couple of years when I finally got a console. I would go crazy for it. I would just, I loved it. I cared so much about it. I was, I was a lot more invested. Uh, now, a new video game game comes out and i'll just i'll kind of play it and you know it almost feels like maybe i'm getting old maybe i'm just not appreciating life as much as i used to or maybe you know i'm becoming jaded but it's not bad it's my opportunity of choice is so large i have so many different video games and some so much access to being able to play it that my appreciation for an individual video game has fallen a little to the wayside and you know, the psychology is there. doesn't mean I can change it necessarily unless I artificially lock off my ability to make those decisions, which is, it's hard to do. And it's hard to do when you're dating or it's hard to do in life in general because we have all of this technology at our fingertips that's supposed to make everything easy. If you listen to our episode about those four-letter words, that's not something that you necessarily want. Yeah, I totally agree with all that. And I feel like it can be 
a little overwhelming and, and sort of a, this mindset of, okay, well, well, what, what am I supposed to do? Because we can't necessarily just turn back the clock and go to a point where everybody kind of played the same thing, watched the same thing, did the same thing. But I think it's more so just having some of the awareness of what some of the rose colored glasses are and, and having a greater appreciation for some of the slow burn aspects of our lives and, and being and doing our best to, you know, be honest with some of when we think back to the past. And so I know for a lot of people, maybe they sort of had glory days that were high school or college or whatever it is. But I think that we just, we remember the highlights and we tend to sort of forget all of the aspects that were really challenging, really frustrating. Um, and, and obviously, yeah, that this may not apply to everybody because it could be that there really have been some major struggles that have happened in your life kind of since an earlier time. And there have been some major events where, you know, maybe this time really is a, a tougher spot to be in. And that's a whole, whole nother episode, but. I think there are plenty of people that actually the the stage of life that they're in has a lot of good in it and a, a lot of things to really be grateful for and, and a lot of things that maybe are improved over, you know, in the past when you're in high school and you could be, you know, paralyzed by your crush thinking that you were silly and like that could cause you to like not eat dinner and like lose your appetite to, to me just thinking about that now it's just kind of a little bit ludicrous as far as some of the differences and just self-confidence self-identity and some of those types of things but instead you just remember oh man we got to do these awesome halo system links where i got to stay up late with all my friends and, and play video games and all that sort of stuff and so like yes there, there are advantages there are things we miss there are things that we could do in other stages of life that we couldn't do now similarly with marriage relationships that kind of first spark stage um that's a that's a unique and really cherished precious time of life and sometimes if you're going through a tough time right now you you sort of romanticize some of those times in the past but again we sort of forget all of the the frustration that can be a part of the whole dating period and like not having that committed relationship and all the good that comes from that. And again, if you think about, you know, another crush that you had before the spouse and you sort of compare some of that, like new, fresh feeling to how you feel right now, of course, those things are different. You're talking about a relationship that is, you know, five, 10, 15, 30 years in the making versus that new sort of fresh, exciting thing. They're different. You cannot compare those things together and expect that to be an even comparison. That's truly an apples to oranges type of comparison. So I, I think it's just being mindful of some of those things. It's, it's trying to take off some of those rose colored glasses that you have of the past and trying to think through, okay, well, if I put those same rose colored glasses on for what I'm going through right now, what are some of the highlights that actually exist that I can be grateful for? What are some of the lowlights I'm facing now that in reality, you know, that that was also kind of there in the past and in, in, in these other situations. Absolutely. And mindfulness is obviously one of those things we've talked about a lot on here. Uh, <laughs> possibly every episode. <laughs> I, I would actually put money on that, that mindfulness has come up almost every episode. But, but something to think about as well, or to be mindful about uh, on what Daniel said was, you know, we, we put those, we compare our, our present to the past and that by itself is problematic. We, we don't want to do that as a comparison, especially when you're looking at opportunities, whenever you're trying to find a way to, you know, chase that never say no to awesome mindset and say yes to something that, you know, maybe doesn't sound very fun or is not as easy as you're hoping it would be, but being mindful of some of your probably best memories started out with a fair bit of suffering. Uh, at, at least for me, a lot of the times that I remember in, in that positive light was actually something that was really hard or really painful or 
whatever it was, but it, it's almost never the, the easy, the fun stuff. It's, there are some of those times where it was fun, but a lot of it is like the, the shared suffering I had with friends or some of the hardships that I overcame, the situations I put myself in and then came out on the other side. Those are the really good core memories that I have. And I it might say more about me as a person if that's not something that everybody does, <laughs> but that's where I met on that. And I think that never saying no to awesome really applies to looking at it from that, that mindful perspective of, is this going to make a good memory? Like if I do this, will it make a good memory or will it have a positive impact on my life? Um, versus is this a, is this an easy way out of saying no to something? Would it be easier, better to say no? Um, an example of that, and there's nothing wrong with this because I have gotten much better at staying in for the night, but very few interesting stories come about either at work or, you know, after work from saying no to something. Uh, a lot of the more interesting parts of our lives, the, the moments that define us come from us saying yes to something when we are uncomfortable and being mindful of that is really important. I think. All right. So our challenge this week, as you can probably guess, is to try saying yes to something that maybe you wouldn't normally say yes to. Maybe it makes you a little bit uncomfortable, but it is something that could be awesome, whether it's something that you know, maybe could be awesome for you or more importantly, it could be awesome for somebody else. An example of that is helping somebody move, right? Like that doesn't really seem all that fun but there's a good chance that you'll learn a little bit about something for somebody else and the person that you say yes to, wow, that will be amazing for them. Uh, you'll, you'll become their new best friend. At the very least, hopefully you'll get some pizza. So I can almost guarantee there'll be something that will come up across the course of this next week where you'll have the chance to look at your ability, basically saying, would I be able to do this? And then your capacity saying, do I realistically have the time to do it? And I, I would challenge you, we would challenge you to, to be a little bit aggressive with your thoughts and expanding your thoughts on what your ability, what your capacity might be. So give it a try, see how it goes. Let us know if you discover your next new favorite thing, or let us know if you have a really terrible experience and, you know, maybe you'll at least get a good story out of it. So that's all we have for this week. As always, we appreciate you coming by. We appreciate you listening. And until next time, this is Dead by Tomorrow.